Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Wallace Foundation Distinguished Lecture and to introduce you to this year's speaker, Dr. Carla O'Connor. Um, my name is Jennifer Holm. I am program co-chair for the AERA annual meeting. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy. And I have long been an admirer of Dr. Uh, O'Connor's work. In fact, I was looking last night and I realized I'd uh, been assigning her work pretty much the entire time I've been a professor. So um, it's just a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce her today. Um, Dr. Carla O'Connor is Professor of Education and an Arthur F. Thurnow Professor of, at the University of Michigan. She is currently the Director of University of Michigan Wolverine Pathways, a free year-round program that partners with the families, schools, and communities of Detroit, Ypsilanti, and Southfield, Michigan to support academic success, college admission, and career exploration. She is also a founding member of the NSF-sponsored Center for the Study of Black Youth in Context. Dr. O'Connor received an MA and PhD in education from the University of Chicago and a BA in English from Wesleyan University. A sociologist of education, Carla O'Connor has expertise in the areas of African American achievement, cultural studies, urban education, and ethnographic methods. Her work includes examinations of how black identity is differently constructed across multiple contexts and influences educational outcomes how black people's perceptions of opportunities vary within and across social space and shape academic orientation, how black educational resilience and vulnerability is structured by social, institutional, and historical forces, and how the organization and culture of schools influence students' social and academic identities and outcomes. She is currently conducting a study on race and the co-construction of family school relations in one demographically diverse elementary school. Her work has been published in the American Educational Research Journal, Educational Researcher, Sociology of Education, Review of Research in Education, Teaching and Teacher Education, and Ethnic and Racial Studies. She co-edited with Erin Horvat the book Beyond Acting White, Reframing the Debate on Black Student Achievement, and has contributed to multiple handbooks and edited volumes that contend with issues of educational inequality and access. She was also program chair for the 2018 annual meeting and currently serves on the AERA Journal Publications Committee. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Carla O'Connor. Good morning. I'm pleased um, and honored to be here, humbled quite a bit when I think about the people who gave uh, this talk uh, before me. I really have to give thank you to Amy and Jennifer and Janelle um, for inviting me uh, to do this um, talk today. And glad that you all were willing to come out early uh, this morning. Um, I want to begin um, by thinking about um, an influence I had very early on, an influence both in terms of an author and a teacher. And with that, my talk is actually gonna begin with a quote from James Baldwin. And I had been introduced to James Baldwin when I was in junior high school. I was introduced to Baldwin by Mrs. Hawkins, a African-American minister who wore a pepper gray afro um, and, a, and taught seventh and eighth grade English. And neither my, I should say at the time, neither my peers nor I were sophisticated enough or mature enough to appreciate Baldwin, um, and especially the book that she was teaching us uh, at the time, which was Go Tell It on the Mountain. And through that text, Mrs. Hawkins was trying to teach us how to establish claims and warrants through essay writing. And we complained incessantly about the assignment of this book only to each other and never to Ms. Hawkins. Um, but my connection to the book and to the author and to myself would change after Mrs. Hawkins graded my first essay. I had entitled my essay, Hatang Lotion, as I had chosen to analyze the main character's emotional arc over the course of the novel. His movement through hate, anger, loneliness, and confusion, alas, Hatang Lotion. Um, I was only 12 or 13 at the time. 
uh, with, with Ms. Hawkins having graded and returned my essay to me, my heart sank as I pieced through it. By now, I had a very strong academic identity. And page after page, I saw nothing but Ms. Hawkins' uh, red marks. Then teachers were still using red pencils and red pens. And it was a crimson indictment of my poor proofreading. But there on the last page, amidst the sea of red, um, she had assigned me a grade of A++. And in that same red ink, she lauded and responded in detail to the substance of my argument and my analysis. As photographers do, she had purposely manipulated the depth of field. She had placed in sharp focus what I had to say and had accorded that high value, framing me as an intellectually able student who had depth and possibility. Yet she did not ignore my errors in style, grammar, and spelling, and they were many. Those aspects of my work were still in view. However, their distance from the object of focus were such that the eye recognized but did not linger there. As such, her read of that middle school essay acknowledged my texture and capacity, situated me as a complex being. My figure was multidimensional rather than flat, and had ultimately escaped distortion. And I remember almost as if it was yesterday how I felt. Um, I remember feeling seen in a way I had never before been seen in school, and I recall quite vividly the power and agency I'd experienced in that recognition. The need and desire to be seen and recognized is echoed in this quote by Baldwin. In 1960, in an interview being conducted on Canadian television, James Baldwin proclaimed, I don't know what white people see when they look at a Negro anymore, but I do know very well. I realized when I was very young, whatever he was looking at, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was something he was afraid of. It was something to which he was attracted to or which he found repulsive, but it wasn't me. As was often the case for Baldwin, he said a lot in very little space. His words made clear the pervasiveness, persistence, and essentializing nature of racialized distortions, in those, this case, those that define and imprison black bodies. In particular, his words evidence that the black image is regularly distorted, that the distortions are perceptible even to young children. That the nature of the distortions, that the, that the nature of the distortions do shift over time. His reference to any more in this quote is actually a rebuttal to the interviewer's suggestion that whites, having encountered Harry Belafonte and Lorraine Hansberry and even Baldwin himself, no longer defaulted to the stereotypes of the Bojangles, the Aunt Jemimas, and the Step and Fetches. But Baldwin, Baldwin responded that while the articulated distortions may have changed over time, they nevertheless remained distortions. And fourth, that the distortions, however variable across historical time, are not just untrue, but vulgar. Vulgar in the sense that they lack texture and nuance and complexity, whether good or bad, invoking fear or attraction, repulsion or entertainment, they are unidimensional, and ultimately deny blacks full humanity. In earlier work, I have described these distortions as a function of refraction, or how individuals come to experience their identities in time and in space as a consequence of how others make sense of and subsequently respond to them. That is, while individuals articulate their own sense making about who they are and with whom they belong via a range of performances, with whom they opt to socialize, how they behave, their style, dress, language, demeanor, and politics, the opportunities and constraints they encounter are a function of how others not only make sense of this and these performances, but about the body doing the performance. As such, different bodies doing the same thing are not necessarily rendered in the same way and are accorded 
different responses that meet with different consequences. After nearly three generations, Baldwin's ob observations regarding the refraction and subsequent distortion of black bodies remain relevant. Today, the consequences also remain deadly. These consequences have been marked via the bodies of Eleanor Bumpers, Trayvon Martin, Deborah Danner, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Oscar Grant, Renisha McBride, Michael Brown, Taisha Shanae Miller, Eric Gardner, and discuss most recently Antoine Rose. This list includes men and women and children and the elderly, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, sons and daughters, and students. Most tragically, the list is far from complete. When not deadly, these consequences are physically and symbolically violent and are often evidenced in school. Recall the adolescent girl who was assaulted in her classroom. Her chair flipped over with her in it. Her body slammed to the ground and dra dragged violently across the floor by a deputy sheriff who was assigned as a resource officer. Now I would say it's an irony of it in and of itself that he is described as a resource officer. For the, those of you who don't recall, <laughs> Then there was the first grader who was berated and belittled in her classroom because she counted wrong. know about you all, but it seemed like it was the teacher who needed to go to the calm down corner. Um, but more profoundly, the consequences in school need not be so glaring, need not be experienced by these more extreme circumstances. In fact, the consequences may be particularly intractable as per their articulation in everyday and mundane interactions that have become routinized and systematically structure school inequality. In fact, researchers have increasingly documented and conceptualized how taken for granted everyday micro interactions and the embedded distortions of mar marginalized and mi minoritized folk compound over time to produce and reify educational stratification and inequality. Reaching as far back as the 1970s, Ray Riss demonstrated how a teacher's prejudicial assessments with its normative middle class reference, and I would argue 
these were themselves racialized, albeit not central to wrist analysis. As you think about the markers that the teacher used, whether it's the straightened and pressed hair to the, um, langu the st use of standard English and, and how that, those are encoded by race. And these um, interpretations of ability informed her grouping and her instructional practices such that her distorted impressions of who was academically able and less able became self-fulfilling prophecy. Consider why um, we also only evidence disproportionality in subjective disability categories, with racial disproportionality being especially heightened in the BD category, and that a referral for assessment almost guarantees special education placement. There is evidence that the referrals often reflect racialized micro-assessments on the part of the referee, assessments that are necessarily entangled with normative middle-class interpretations of what constitutes appropriate development, as that is articulated by behavior, language, learning, and expression. As a corollary, consider how the inclusion of subjective factors exacerbate the racial stratification that is evidenced via ability grouping and tracking. That is the inclusion of teacher and counselor recommendations as well as parent preference magnifies the extent to which race and class predict track placement. And as Amanda Lewis, Jennifer Miller, and I have previously argued, sole reliance on objective factors for track placements, such as test scores, are insufficient correctives in that they mask the many, many, many moments of everyday racism that operate at the micro level to stratify opportunities to learn within classrooms creating opportunity gaps that produce achievement outcomes that then determine eligibility for gifted or more rigorous course options. Given the contemporary recognition of how micro interactions operate systematically to produce racial hierarchies in school and school systems, my goal today is to have us think more deliberately about how we can better delineate empirically and conceptually the complexity and temporal spread of these micro moments, and how we as researchers should work to not only reveal such complex dynamics, but build in the process more complex representations of racial, racially minoritized people, and by, and by implication, white people. I will argue that as educational researchers, this will require us to frame our investigation in ways that approximate, approximate what would be akin to a photographer's use of the wide angle shot. The benefit of the wide angle shot is that it builds depth of field. It enhances perspectives and achieves a three dimensional quality. I want to illuminate today what would constitute depth of field and three-dimensional quality in educational research that it seeks to explore the micro-level structuring of educational inequality and also the multidimensionality of minoritized subjects. Towards this end, the remainder of my talk is organized into two segments. In the first segment, I braid together the research on black boys' disproportionate experience with school discipline and my own experience as a mother of black boys to illustrate the promise of the wide angle view. These are my boys. Um, little Al is far from little um, anymore, but he still tolerates us calling him little Al. The illustration is intended to make evident how a wide angle view allows us to capture the multi-dimensional multi nature of micro moments, situating time as an especially underexplored dimension that necessarily intersects with those dimensions that have otherwise captured our analyses of micro moments. Those would be the individual but never idiosyncratic articulations of identities, performances, and sense-making. The school organization represented by this um, box, or I should say the school represented by this box, and within schools, thinking about the organization, the norms, 
and the policies and practices that establish the playing field that bound these individual articulations. And running through and around these planes are broader structural markers of power and status, gender, class, race, and the fact that these things have their intersections, um, and also the fact that within the organization of schools itself, there's also role and position as a power, as a power dynamic at play. In the second segment, I will outline research methods and conceptual orientations that promise to better illuminate this multidimensionality and especially influence, and especially the influence of time. Beginning first with the case illustration. Scholars have repeatedly documented how schooling agents are not only more apt to surveil the bodies of black children, in and of itself creating the likelihood that they will find some black child breaking some school rule, but that black children are more apt to find themselves in school trouble for subjective offenses. Offenses such as transgression, defiance, and disrespect. Offenses that require interpretation on the part of the evaluator. The work of Skiba and his colleagues have documented such differential assessment. The work of Ann Ferguson delineates the adultification of black boys and that their expressions of transgression, which she argues are developmental expressions of masculinity that all boys enact, that their expressions are met with punishment rather than edification. The work of Elena Neal documents how the teachers of black girls imagine them as volatile and unpredictable conceive of them as ticking time bombs and as modern day embodiments of Jekyll and Hyde, failing to recognize how the teachers themselves actually ignite or trigger the very behaviors they demonize. The work of Lewis and Diamond demonstrate that black students are more apt to be selected for punishment because of pervasive racial stereotypes about the criminality of black people and the hypersexuality of black girls. These stereotypes permeate the meaning making of school officials and affect how they apply presumably race neutral disciplinary policies. The significance of these inequalities is not only because getting into trouble might be attributed to the black not me, that teachers and other schooling agents see. The importance is also a function of how these interactions and outcomes codify in the minds of the witnesses that black boys and girls are troubled troublemakers. And I should say I am leaving aside for now the trauma of black children being witness to their bodies being criminalized in this way. I attended a talk um, at the School of Ed that was done by Erica Bullock. And that first clip I showed you, I remember her playing it over and over again. And I remember the kind of impact it had on the audience. audience. And you think about black children witnessing their bodies treated in that way, whether symbolically or uh, physically, and what kind of effect that might have. But for today's talk, I want to focus in on how the inclination to surveil and to interpret the black body in threatening or volatile ways is not only, found, is not only founded in black distortions, but can ultimately reify these distortions, prospectively, prospectively carrying the consequences deep into the future. In those repeated moments when teachers, administrators, security officers, or other school staff label black boys and girls as trouble, there are witnesses to their labeling, namely the other students in that school or in that classroom. All of these child witnesses will grow into adults and carry with them these vulgar images of who blacks are and are not. As adults, they, in the absence of disruptive experiences, are then apt to gaze upon the black body as their teachers, administrators, and security officers had. This gaze is so powerful that even black children may find themselves vulnerable to it. Take my own black son, now 15. This is a picture of him in the third grade. 
And in the third grade, he came home one Friday and asked me, Mom, why are the black boys so bad? I asked him to explain more, and he indicated that with the exception of him, the other black boys in his classroom always seemed to be getting in trouble with the teacher. I told him, I need you to do me a favor. In the next week, I want you to take note of each time a black boy gets into trouble. And I want you to ask yourself, did anyone else do that same thing? And if they did, what did the teacher do? We did not make it to the end of the week. By Wednesday, he said, oh my goodness, mom, it's like the teacher never sees the other kids doing the same thing, or she doesn't care. And he additionally shared his perception that the white children's displays of comparable behavior were more sneaky, his word. He discussed it as less bold, less loud, and um, more subtle. I had asked my son to expand his gaze, to not only focus on whom, what, or where the teacher was directing her attention, directing his attention, and that of the other students in the class, but to step back and take a wide angle view, one that was not bound by the frame that the teacher had established. This wide angle view enabled him to see and situate black boys' behavior within a broader web of meaning making, performance, and interaction. In so doing, he observed and discussed the following. Black boys' behaviors exhibited tendencies akin to that of other children, but could differ in tone, balance, and timing. As per my son's assessment, that black boys' behaviors were less sneaky. This observation begins to anticipate the work of Kara Lee, Chris Gutierrez, Arnitha Ball, Barbara Rogoff, Naila Nasser, and others who conceptualize and evidence in different ways the cultural articulation and variation in learning and development. While my son had evaluated negatively that which he had perceived as the more sneaky behavioral tendency of white students, those behaviors compared to the less sneaky behaviors of the black boys were not positioned as problems. Making transparent the power differential between teacher and student and her evaluative, evaluative gaze wielding more power and influence than his own. Such observations bring to mind the work of Prudence Carter, Angela Valenzuela, Luis Moll, Taro Yoso, and others who differently demonstrate the ways that the norms and expectations of school privilege the knowledge, know-how, and expressions of those who are white and middle class, thereby denying, marginalizing, or stigma thereby denying, marginalizing, and stigmatizing the cultural resources, cultural wealth, cultural capital and funds of knowledge extant in minoritized communities. My son came to recognize that some children for these and other reasons escaped his teacher's gaze and thus her punishment and or public positioning of them as trouble, implicitly situating them as good and thereby positioning them in sharp relief to black boys' constructions as both troubled and troubling. Here we are reminded of the findings of LaRue, Lewis McCoy, Edward Morris, Pedro Nogueira, and Carla Shalaby, in addition to my previous reference to the work of Ferguson and Lewis and Diamond. And finally, in the midst of these attended patterns, there was variation, as my son, who while asking about the status of black boys, was himself a black boy who did not find himself in trouble. My own work and that of many others, including but not limited to Antwi Acom, Carolyn Tyson, Erin McNamara Horvat, and Sean Harper, has sought to document less told stories of black academic success and also the variation that occurs in the intersection of black identity and school performance. Ultimately, my son came to understand that black boy troubles were not singly a function of how black boys behaved, but a function of where the teacher focused her gaze and how she then notated and evaluated that which was inside her frame. 
Like my Ms. Hawkins, she too was a photographer of sorts, but the image she constructed via her framing had blocked out the complex dynamics of that classroom and the many layers of power, interaction, and meaning making that led to black boy trouble. Also blocked from view were the histories of participation in which these dynamics were rooted, namely those histories of participation that are suggested by the questions that surround my son's observations. That is, for each of my son's observation, there was an accordant why that warranted investigation. Why do we see the pattern differences in the performance in black and other students, in this case, white students in his classroom? Why did the teacher's actions convey a different evaluative stance than his own? Why did the teacher focus her gave where and how she had? Why did my son's experience differ from that of the other black boys in his class? Previously, I discussed how micro moments reach into the future. They are also tethered to the past. Think about how the answers to these questions reach back in time, revealing histories and histories of participation that are animated at the level of the individual and at micro interactions. It mattered that, that African Americans had expressions of style, culture, and identity that predated their enslavement in the US, and that these expressions morphed or were differently articulated as per black protest and creativity in the midst of bondage and oppression. Expressions of agency that were distinct from, but also in relation to, the style, culture, and identity of their white oppressors. It mattered that my son was black, but also upper middle class, and lived in a middle class subdivision that was next to, but apart from, the apartment complex and working class neighborhood across the bridge from where the other black boys in his class lived. It mattered that his teacher was white and had grown up and gone to school in the same town in which she taught, a university town with a school district that had struggled historically with the racial stratification and inequality that reflected but was not limited to that which prompted my son's ask of me. And there are a host of other institutionalized forces that shape the experiences of both the boys and the teacher. So while race and class and space and these other forces did not determine the sense making and performances that got articulated and tangled in the dynamics of my son's classroom, they did influence in powerful ways how the different boys performed their blackness and their boyhood and what attracted or escaped the teacher's gaze and her accordant evaluations and responses. As such, the past is necessarily present, even if rendered invisible in these micro moments of inequality. And time also matters in yet another way. The broader historical moment and the accordance structures, opportunities, and discourses also frame micro interactions. Consider what it means to be situated as troubled and troubling when the raging contemporary discourses are three strikes you're out and zero tolerance as opposed to before or after the institutionalization of these discourses. As scholars, our challenge is to figure out how to capture the temporal spread of micro moments akin to how photographers use a wide angle lens to increase the depth of field. Vorn Camp indicates, in a sense, every act of creating a photograph is an act of framing. We frame a scene with our camera and capture it with a photograph. The camera and the lens determine the field of view, and through aiming, zooming, and positioning, we decide what to include or exclude from that field of view. Together then, lenses and techniques determine the nature of inclusion or exclusion. The wide angle shot allows for enhanced perspective and depth of field, enabling the subject to be situated in a more expansive and elaborate field of view, one that has free three dimensional quality. As educational researchers, we too are photographers of sort, 
of, of sorts, and framing educational investigation is akin to framing photographic shots in that the structure and logic of our investigations determine who and what is in view, or an ode to James Baldwin, who gets seen, how they are seen, and whether the subject of focus recognizes themselves and their experiences in the research we conduct. The question arises, how do we begin to capture this multidimensionality, and especially its temporal spread via the methods and the analytical foci we employ? This brings me to the second segment of my talk. What methodological and conceptual directions are warranted to establish a wide angle view? I will talk about each of these in turn, but we ultimately need to analyze and theorize the impact of macrohistorical forces, design multi-level ethnographic studies, study the identity, beliefs, and behavior of those who have historically escaped the gaze and privilege the voice and perspective of those most subject to distortion. Beginning with the first point, we need to take seriously the impact of macrohistorical forces. We must deliberately delineate and contend with the influence of nation state policies, public discourses, and social movements or lack thereof within and across historical time. We already know that the experience of group membership from one historical period to the next is not the same. Taking just racialized examples for now, consider being black in the Jim Crow era versus the civil rights era versus the Reagan era versus the presumably post-racial era, which we now know is not true, or many of us actually knew that back then, um, against the Trump era, right? Consider being Muslim or being perceived as Muslim before and after 9-11. Consider being Latino before and after the travel ban and the normalization of xenophobic sentiments and narrative, narratives from the president's bully pulpit. Being any of these identities or being perceived as any of these identities in a particular historical time, in a particular nation, always and already influences extant structural barriers and opportunities as well as discursive possibilities barriers, opportunities, and possibilities that then frame the degrees of freedom within which members of a group operate. For example, whom else they are likely to encounter of, as part of their everyday experiences? What status, power, or influence these others may have over them? the available tools of resistance or engagement in these encounters, and the accordant expressions of identity of which group members might avail themselves within that same space and time. But to take seriously macrohistorical influences, we must embrace interdisciplinarity. We must braid together conceptual and methodological tools and frameworks that might be drawn from history, sociology, and education. It is in this space that we can also begin to explore, as indicated by James Mahoney, whether and how comparative historical analysis might be able to accommodate micro-level units. We must otherwise push boundaries of extant methodological approaches. Take cohort studies, which are typically epidemiological in their orientation and privileged survey research. How might we stretch their analytical and theoretical power by more deliberate reliance on a comparative, on comparative age cohort studies that document life histories and life narratives in relation to some educational problem? Take my own effort to dabble with this methodological possibility and to make sense of educational resilience of black women across distinct age cohorts. These women's life stories reveal that while they shared the outcome of having beaten the odds of making it to college as per their first gen status, the pathways and mechanisms they engaged and the nature and tenor of the micro relations embedded therein were a function of and responsive to the resources, opportunities, and constraints that were specific to the period in which they came of age making evident that resilience was not a personal trait. It was an institutionalized and structured phenomenon with an articulation that varied across time and space. 
Then, how do we think about the desi designing multi-level ethnographic studies? Within any macro-historical moment, there are influences further down the ecological chain that additionally affect micro-interactions and the consequent individual level life chances, experiences, and outcomes. As such, Lewis Miller and I have previously argued the benefits of, of multi-level ethnographic studies. If we are committed to studying the nature and outcomes of the micro-interaction that emerged in my son's classroom and in the many classrooms across the nation and the globe, we must understand and document how these interactions are nested with and influenced by these broader ecological influences. We in the field of education need to especially illuminate the micro-level impact of school, district, and state educational policies and practices. But as demonstrated by Lewis and Diamond, the influence of these policies and official practices are not independent of human interpretation and, and animation. How people make sense of and enact educational policies and the rules that are set to govern educational practice ultimately determine their impact. And this, too, must be our focus of study. Final, additionally, we need to study the identity, beliefs, and behaviors of those who have historically escaped the gaze, namely the socioeconomic elite and whites and whiteness. While these groups and these reflections of identity has been, have been situated normatively and have been studied sub substantively with regards to establishing a standard by which other groups have been evaluated. They have not until recently been examined with an eye towards understanding their role in the on-the-ground production and articulation of educational problems and inequalities. In making sense of educational problems and inequalities, we have more often than not asked what is wrong with the groups who seem to be having the greatest problems in school or who find themselves at the bottom of the educational hierarchy. What kinds of dysfunction do they carry with them into schools that make them vulnerable to underachievement or school trouble? Even when we have studied the organization and structural inequalities that riddle schools and place some students and not others at heightened educational risks, our analyses have not until more recently focused on unpacking the motives and potential dysfunction of those who design, enact, and interpret the policies and routines that pose the risk. As suggested by some of my previous comments concerning the promise of multi-level ethnographies, more recent efforts to analyze everyday racism, including opportunity hoarding, are moving us in the right direction. But black and brown bodies are not only subject to dis distortion when we fail to analyze how they are institutionally placed at risk as per cultural biases and social group conflicts over power and access that get articulated on the ground each day, they are also subject to distortion because it is assumed that the stories that are told about them, particularly those stories that have purchase in broader public discourses, are their stories alone. Take, for example, the presumption that black students are susceptible to negative peer pressure when it comes to doing well in school. This discourse situates such susceptibility as a black cultural trait rather than as a developmental vulnerability with which young people of all races might contend. With more recent work indicating that blacks may be less susceptible than whites to such pressure, that the expression of peer pressure is inextricably tied to the racial and academic organization of schools, and that white adolescents are apt to animate anti-achievement pressure in distinct ways. The work in Dar of Darity and Tyson has been particularly edifying on this point, as well as the work of Angel Harris. Consider also Sunia's Luther's work on the maladjustment of wealthy suburban kids, read white kids who are wealthy, while public discourse and empirical studies have emphasized the risky behaviors of urban children, read black and brown kids who are also imagined as poor. Luther and others have begun to document the high levels of depressive and anxiety symptoms, self-injurious behaviors, drug use and abuse, random acts of delinquency, and widespread cheating. 
we can only recall the news, their parents are involved too, uh, that plague these adolescent communities. Empirical investigations of this kind necessarily disrupt master def deficit narratives in which black and brown students and communities are enshrined. If we only investigate black youth as problems and also fail to make white and wealthy youth the object of study, we reify the pathology of blackness and by implication, the goodness of whiteness, masking the texture, complexity, and variation of both communities. Finally, we need to privilege the voice and perspective of those most subject to distortion to escape the kinds of distortions discussed previously, we need to privilege these voices um, because they're apt to reveal the historically situated and institutionally structured nature of their identities, performances, and assessments, and how those get articulated at the micro level, but are often rendered on a flat plane that essentializes these persons oversimplifies them and reduces them to stereotypes. As an illustration, um, I'm gonna have us listen for a bit to the voice and perspective of one black mother. This mother, who I will refer to as Mrs. Marshall, is a participant in a study on race and family school relations that I am conducting with my University of Michigan colleagues, Davey Kasnabis, Simona Golden, and Kendra Hearn, and also with Elena Neal, a postdoctoral fellow, and our graduate research assistants, Jenny Sawada, Ebony Peros, Harvey, and Parker Miles. In the interest of time, I will not go into detail about Mrs. Marshall's background, but suffice to say, she has two daughters, age five and six, who are enrolled in the socioeconomically diverse lower elementary school in which we are conducting our study, hereto referred to as Willow Elementary. As with all of our parent participants, we sought to understand how Mrs. Marshall experienced race inside and outside of Willow and how these experiences influenced what she wanted from school, including what she wanted her children to experience in school. As such, we asked parents to share, among other things, what teachers should understand think and do not only in relation to their own family, but in relation to all families who shared their race. Let's take a little listen to some of what Mrs. Marshall shared with us. Um, what do you want teachers to understand most about being a, a black person or um, yeah, just like living the life of a black person? What, what do you think teachers need to understand about that. that. It's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's delicate. Mm -hmm. We sensitive. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to handle us like a care package. Right. We're fragile. Right. Okay. So you got to watch how you greet us. You got to mm -hmm. watch how your body language is because it's easy to offend us. You've been offending us too long. Right. So you got to handle us very like a piece of glass. You don't want to drop us. Right. You don't want to knock us over. You don't want to touch us too hard. You don't want to thump us. You right. don't want to do that. You right. want to grab us gently. Mm -hmm. So handle us with care. We, we be thoughtful to who you're talking to. And understand we've been hurt, so it's a lot of hurt inside of us that we're not just snapping on you and we ain't mad at everybody. It's just that we've been through so much, we, we still carry it on our back. Right, right. And it's hard. In this excerpt, Mrs. Marshall registers the salience of the dominant narrative of the angry black mother when she points out that we not just snapping on you. She complicates that narrative in multiple ways. First, she rounds out its hard edges, making evident that it is also about pain. We hear that pain not only in what she says, but in how she says it. And she also makes evidence that the act of snapping on you does not represent some constant state of being. She notes, we ain't mad at everybody. Rather, feelings and demonstration of anger are contextually driven. Some of that context is defined by group histories of racial discrimination, and Mrs. Marshall indicates that those group histories are symbolically registered in contemporary bodies, as per her, as per her notation that you done offended us too long. 
obviously she's not talking about that teacher in and of itself, but that the, her teacher's body is signaling a connection with the past. The individual white teacher she encounters may have not offended her, but nevertheless symbolizes that offense and must be mindful that in her interactions with black mothers and particularly Mrs. Marshall, because what's important to understand is different mothers will have different renderings of this relationship. But that some of these perspective, and what's also important is some of the perspective anger is in direct reaction to what a teacher may say or do. In this next expert, we get a little window into that. She comes off real dry. Right. It's like, and she don't. She I should say, in this expert excerpt, she's talking about her oldest daughter's current teacher, who she doesn't like, right, in comparison to the previous teacher who she likes. And so I'll start it again, but it's a description of the current teacher she has concerns with. She comes off real dry. Right. It's like, and she don't, she never greeted me before. When I come through the door, she, she whatever she's doing to her class, she continue to do her she class. She doesn't look up. She kind of look up and it's like, and like you, we never even met before. Right. It's right. my first time entering your class. Don't you kind of want to greet me? Yeah. And I'm always walking in like, hey, class, you know, I'm going to speak to the kids right, too. Right, right, right. But you know, and I, I always went, I was like, I don't care. I don't care for her. Today, she was a little more warm, mm -hmm. still dry. Right. And I don't know, that's probably just her personality, but, but as, as me as a black woman, you gotta be a little more sensitive and open. Right, right. You know, and I don't know if like, cause you know, at the same time, sometimes I'd be like, dude, they handle us like they so scared of us. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and I don't know if that's it, that, that I feel like you drive because she timid. Right. And that's how she was doing the day, like class, come, come on. Like, I'm not gonna get mad at these kids, I'm very patient. Right. So I don't know if it's that they, that they when we when they see us they 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 afraid of us mm -hmm. or is it just they don't they not open and aware to us. Right. Isn't that, I'm not mad at right. nobody. It's just we still carrying that weight because I'm still going through it every day. Right. Exactly. I'm fighting every day. Via this excerpt, Mrs. Marshall indicates that what she registered is problematic on the part of the teacher. Her not looking up her not being warm or open may be a function of the teacher's personality. She might just naturally be timid. But Mrs. Marshall also indicates that she has no way of knowing, in part because the dominant narrative of the angry black woman is so pervasive, white teachers are potentially afraid of black mothers. But Mrs. Marshall importantly notes that even it is, if it is the case that the teacher may be naturally timid, in her professional role, she needs to enact a professional stance that is open and aware of black women's history and experience, including the fact that Mrs. Marshall is still fighting racism every day. At, right after this excerpt, she goes on to explain you know, the kind of racism she's experiencing on her job. And that too is filtering how it is she enters into this moment. In some ways, it also, um, brings to mind the work of Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, who talks about the kind of ghosts that enter into the classroom, right? And we're having us, I'm having us think about today that both, that in those micro interactions, what um, Lawrence Lightfoot refers to as ghosts, um, that I'm referring to as structured um, experiences that sort of determine how you, your identities, your performances, um, and the like all combine in the, in the classroom and other schooling spaces to determine um, access or the denial of access when it comes to educational opportunity. So in this excerpt, Mrs. Marshall indicates, um, so if teachers are, enter into relationships with black mothers, either unconscious of these histories or dismisses of, dismissive dismissive of them, they are likely to imagine black mothers as vulgar, angry caricatures and are unlikely to engage black mothers in ways that 
facilitate black student success. Mrs. Marshall's then, like the work of Camille Wilson, Gail Thompson, and Leroux, and Horvat remind us that the image of the angry black mother is necessarily a distortion as it masks the personal and group histories of racism and discrimination that give rise to that give rise to it, including how teachers may actually trigger these behaviors as per their insensitivity and lack of awareness um, of these fronts. Um, you know, it's also interesting that Mrs. Marshall also, like Baldwin, be shared in her statement um, that she recognized that the distortions of black bodies, in this case, the distortion of the black women's body, is also in the space and in the air and something that she has to contend with um, while in school. And so I began this talk by posing a challenge. And the challenge for us as educational researchers to think deliberately about how our analytical foci, who and what we gaze upon, as well as our methods, how we gaze, um, on the one hand, can flatten the identity and experience of racially minoritized students as families, as well as the topography in which they operate, the outcome, is distorted images of black and brown bodies and also by implication of white bodies because we make meaning in contrast, right? And at the same time, in the midst of this distortion, we necessarily provide and establish insufficient explanations of racial stratification and inequality in schools. Alternatively, we might design studies of educational inequality in ways that situate racially minoritized students and their families in expanded fields of view. Fields that nest their micro-level interactions and experiences within a more complex institutional and temporal terrain. The alternative is already being evidenced to varying degrees in much of the research I reference in this talk the future demands that educational researchers build upon this momentum. You know, I want to thank you all um, for joining me this morning, but there's other thanks to be given. Um, clearly, I have lots of thanks to give to Ms. Hawkins. Um, I really do think she set me on a trajectory, and it's interesting um, in some ways, hopefully you heard it in this talk, I returned to some of my humanist roots um, in crafting this talk. But I also want to thank, thank Catherine Taylor. You could tell by some of my clumsiness, like, I, I am barely a fan of PowerPoint and definitely not a fan of technology. And Lord knows embedding videos and audio was not my plan, but Catherine Taylor um, was a wonderful help and she made sure the PowerPoint was on point even if I couldn't fully manipulate it. Um, I also need to thank uh, those who nurtured me intellectually early on and ushered me into the academy, especially the late and absolutely brilliant Jerry Watts, who I met as a 17-year-old and has, um, and, bef and uh, up until his passing was an extraordinary mentor to me. And of course, also the incredible uh, Dr. Edgar Epps, who, in, who is the academic father, grandfather, and great grandfather, in fact, of many people, of some of the people I'm seeing in this room. Uh, my big sister, Karen, who's sitting up here, um, who she actually now lives in Tobago, but insisted on flying to Toronto to hear my talk. Uh, she continually reminds me that in my family, we need to learn how to celebrate a little bit more and grind a little less. Um, <laughs> my big brother, Barry, <laughs> who wanted to be here but could not. Uh, he taught me to live loud and live bold among women, but especially among men. My mom, who sacrificed a lot to bring my siblings and me to this country in fulfillment of my father's dream that we would achieve greatness educationally and otherwise. My husband, Alfred Young Jr., also an academic, and who has been my intellectual sparring partner since we were 17 years old. And I mean that in the best way, because if he could not spar with me, I would not have him. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
my family has had to contend with some hard issues over the last month, making it difficult to carve out time to work on this talk. And I leaned on Al to help me make sense of whether today's talk was cogent. So if I didn't make any sense, all blame goes to him. <laughs> And um, finally, and most significantly, my boys, who are always on my mind, always in my heart, and always with my spirit, and who give me powerful reason to be focused on the issues that continually drive my research agenda. Thank you. Adrian Dixon, can you talk a little more about the multi-level um, ethnographies? And um, I remember a little bit of it right. when um, uh, through Agbu's work. But is that are, are you kind of pushing back against that? What do you? Yeah. So doing? it's not so much Agbu's work, but the, the, you know, eth the power of ethnographies is they really do give us a deep window in you know everyday meaning making. For, in, including how racism gets instructed. But what we need, the part, when we talk about multi-level ethnographies, we're saying that we not only want to look at the micro moment, but you not, need to simultaneously document that that moment is within bigger institutional context, right? So while you can't analyze everything, analytically, you have to at least attend to what is it about that school that might be informing part of what you're seeing in those micro interactions, right? Um, so, you know, are there particular policies that already begin to constrain the things that the way that people move and act? If that school is situated in a particular context, a New York City versus a small time, there's sort of broader dynamics. And though ethnographers can't capture everything, they have to be mindful as they document the um, those the, the on the ground moments that they're not independent of these broader shaping experiences and have to lend an analytical eye to that as part of the analysis. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I've been struggling with, a little bit with is um, the discourses that inform perceptions of children. And um, especially this latest discourse, I think, around trauma that I'm, I'm troubled by um, because I feel like um, uh, it tends, it creates a narrative that can um, reify deficit thinking, you know, deficits around families and also has this really, um, I think, troubling biological kind of um, implications around deficit narratives that feeds into these narratives that have been around for many, many years. And so I just was curious about your thoughts around it, that it's issue. It's funny you say that because we were just discussing it uh, the other day. So I struggle a lot um, with the discourse on trauma, not because I don't believe that kids have had traumatic experiences and in the clinical sense, but it's become, it's completely co-founded at this point with low income um, and well, black, brown, low income students, right? And so that pe people begin to imagine that all black and brown people living in poor, poor communities have been traumatized. Um, and so it, in some ways it sort of parallels the, the debate on special education. There are children who need special education. But at the same time, what becomes hard is how do we begin to disentangle those who, that, those who actually need it versus those who get caught up in the discourse of ability that actually doesn't recognize the diversity of learning and expression that we see. And um, 
what troubles me is e when you go into even public schools now, the first thing I'm hearing teachers talk about, well, you know, they've had trauma, or they've experienced trauma. And I'm like, how do you know they've experienced trauma? It's like being poor and being black is not in and of itself traumatic. In some ways it might be um, liberatory in a lot of ways when you think about um, the ability to engage uh, productively with power and oppression. And so I, I, I'm sort of struggling with how we're gonna get out of it because there's a paternalistic and a kind of intent to care, but it becomes a dysfunctional care because you lose sight of the very things I'm saying, the variation in communities, the goodness and power in the communities, and you reduce them to a, to a victimized people who need um, clinical intervention that gets articulated in like a schooling space. Um, but I, I think it is troubling because it denies the diversity and the agency of black and brown um, communities living in poverty. That's your next article. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> First, thank you for your talk. It was amazing, and you're just amazing. But I think the thing that I want to <laughs> invoke is um, the fact that you are a, a black mother. And as an interviewer um, um, of a black mother, what would that experience was like for you? And what ways, given that there might be class differential or different kinds of social identities that are playing out there, how you thought about that interaction? You know, it's funny, because this, I, you know, I, I study black people. I've do, done lots of interviews with black people, but this woman struck me. And I'll be honest, this is the first time I felt like I lost my interviewer's orientation because she had me crying during the interview. And I think you could even hear the amen corner in the, <laughs> in the tape because as a black mother living in the same guess I shouldn't say that, living in the same space, uh, I resonated in really powerful ways um, with her pain and her fears and the like, but in many ways that was an affordance in the interview, right? Because, you know, though I was amening, she, it, it, I think she saw my recognition of her in that space and she just continued to talk and talk and talk. And so it ended up being an extraordinary um, resource. And it was funny, when it was finished, she said, oh, I needed this therapy. <laughs> she said, I feel like I was in a clinical session, <laughs> you know? Um, and, we, and, and, and what was powerful is we clearly are not of the same class background. Um, Mrs. Marshall is still working on her GED. And she had moved to this particular town because she had grown up in a large urban area where she thought she had been denied, she and her husband had been denied educational opportunities. And they moved to this town a month after um, their first child was born for t to provide her children with a bet which ended up being two better educational opportunities and as she discussed acquired a life right and so while she's seeking these opportunities she's in this space where she's feeling put upon and she's trying to um, resolve um, that tension and we we sort of recognize each other even if it would from different class points trying to resolve the same tension with me clearly having more resources and opportunities to figure, figure out that resolution, but our black children not necessarily being imagined in different ways, right? So we connected um, on that point. And so, um, and I think, you know, I think my manner of presentation and style still resonated in some place with hers, even if our manner and tone of talk was slightly different, so. Hi. Hi. Brilliant talk. Um, and I, I, this question may not be fully formed, but I'm thinking about the, um, wide angle shot mm -hmm. and that as depending on our positionality as a researcher our subjectivity so me being an african-american woman a mom you same 
thinking about how we also are familiar with the shot as we step into the shot. And we, while the shot may be still in terms of a photograph, we have this pr privilege to move through the shot. Um, and I see that in your own story about your sons, in your interview with the mom, mm -hmm. in the privilege that you have of knowing her experience with the white teacher. Um, and I guess thinking about my own experience in the field of how these, I don't know how those things kind of remain still. Like, she may not ever say that to the teacher. You become the owner of that information. And so thinking about uh, ethnographic work, history, the multidimensional piece that you're talking about, what is our responsibility, if any, as researchers to try to activate things in this shot to bring people together? Or we talk about, well, how do we leave the research space, right? So kind of thinking about that and any advice you may have yeah. for us. That's an easy one for this project. So the, well, those of you who may know my work, I usually leave it at the level of the construction of knowledge. But I'm blessed to have partnered <laughs> with uh, scholars who are uh, master teachers and have been working deliberately in thinking about how do we enact our knowledge and our work with teachers. And the reason we came together is because I had the kind of conceptual focus and they had the, the practice focus and we thought this could be a braiding together of opportunities. So in this particular space, we are actually generating um, the research with an eye towards building teacher professional development, right? Now, they're not gonna be able to hear Miss Marshall, at least her voice, because she's quite recognizable, but we will think, we will package what we learn, what the families in this community tell us, and what's important is this community is quite distinct and edifying for a range of reasons. Um, in the one school in which we're working with, they're drawing from a huge range of, um, a, a very wide range of communities. Racially, ethnically, demographically, I mean, um, socioeconomically, very different communities from um, subsidized housing to McMansions, subdivisions, and I mean, so the, the diversity um, of families, and we are purposely thinking about how the different racial and ethnic groups um, and the socioeconomic variation, what they speak to in terms of what they want from teachers and schools, and we'll work with the school to generate professional development opportunities around that, um, because as you can imagine, the common um, statement on the part of teachers also in the school is that some teach families simply aren't involved. And even when we started this project, our goal was not to get families involved in the schools, but to figure out how schools and teachers need to be responsive to families' knowledge, interpretations, and perspectives those parents may never actually walk into the schools. So it, it's been interesting as we're thinking about the use of this also, and this goes to how frames affect you, because even though that's what we've been saying, some of what we get in the day-to-day -day is the teachers looking forward to us teaching them how to get the te families into the building. Yeah. So it's gonna be interesting when we are saying, well, you can use families' knowledge, perspectives, and wisdom about you in ways that nev may never require them to get, come into the building. So we'll face that challenge um, when it comes. Um, thank you for your talk. My question is around the uh, mothering piece. Um, I appreciated your story that you shared, and um, as a mom of two teenage black girls, um, they always inform the way that I'm thinking about things as well. <laughs> even though they never want to hear me say the word narrative or discourse again. Uh, <laughs> they still come to me with questions. Uh, and so what I'm curious about over the time, because I think he was third grade when, when you, you said that. your mm -hmm. co-researcher, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Um, I'm curious as to how their questions and things that they have observed and come to you with over the years has, evol it has evolved um, since then. It's, you know, I can't, so it, 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 it's, it's an interesting dynamic in um, my household. So the, the youngest, the oldest no longer lives at home, but the youngest both sees race and denies race at the same time. 
right? Because he's growing up in a context where he has a kind of intimacy with whites and people that I never had. I grew up in low-income African-American communities until I went away to college, right? And so on the one hand, he's clearly very sophisticated. Um, you know, he, he, he just did a speech at school concerned with how the, ma the um, art teacher um, approached, because he's at an IB school, and he just did a speech to his, his, um, about how the IT teacher approached the teaching of world art. And so when they got to Africa, they presented mass. And he was like, wait a minute. You know, we had this, had this whole complex accounting of art in these other nation states, and now the whole continent is represented by this one art form and, you know, use, um, you know, the danger of a single story to kind of outline his concerns, et cetera, right? Um, and on the one hand, when I'm having my moments, he was like, mom, you see race everywhere. <laughs> Right, so it's a, it's it's interesting how he's both critical in his space and critical of my racial discourse at um, the same time. But that's where context matters, right? I think his his context uh, and context and his identity as upper middle class in this space all are coming together to allow him to take up and resist parts of my teachings um, and sort of come to his own worldview. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at your thir your that teacher in, in your movie. <laughs> you say she's not typical, but I'm scared it can be typical with someone allowed to have a gun, right. and that's that's the big push. I'm like I said, I'm in Florida, and that's the big push for legislatures in terms of dealing with this mass murder murdering that's going on. But you know, I get the feeling it's not going to be about the mass murderers, and I have two sons. Right, right, yeah. I mean, so what we were taught about is distortions, right? So e the teacher does not have to be this extreme teacher. In moments of fear and threat of body, people act all kinds of ways, right? Why does a cop shoot a man lying on his back, hands up, right? And then shoots him, and then the man says, why did you shoot me? And the cop goes, I don't know, <laughs> right? So, so the fact that that can happen, me, I mean, for all kinds of reasons, it would be dangerous for teachers to have guns, even if they didn't have these racialized lenses, but it may be, it would, it's likely to be particularly threatening to bodies you imagine as always and already threatening, right? Because when something goes off, who is likely to be seen as the assailant? Um, and so I think it's dangerous for all children, but particular children will be especially vulnerable in that context when people find themselves frightened. And you know, they don't have to do anything, just your being frightens them. Thank you so much for your talk. Very interesting. Thank you. And motivational at a personal level and for society. At a personal level, I am in measurement. I work for a school district. Um, it's the largest performing urban school district with the highest gap for African-American students. Um, what I wanted to say is, at a personal level, it's sad that putting out data for the last 30 years now, all on you know test scores, showing this gap, it is really sad. And why can't I show more data on how mothers all there's no gap between how they feel on what their students should be when they go to school they have that same desire to achieve that same desire for that student to be successful there is no gap the students motivation when they come to school their excitement their enthusiasm when they come to school there is no gap and that's the kind of data i should have been putting out all these years right. so again you know it's sad haven't done so, but always a new beginning. Um, at a societal level, I really feel when I've been visiting classrooms, collecting data, what I find is, you know, the escape the gaze, you know, we, we saw it in a different lens, but what I also see is a lot of passive aggressive behavior on the teacher's part, where they are ignoring the student and letting them put their head down throughout the whole class period, you know. 
So to me, that kind of escaping the gaze also needs to be addressed, right? There is that deficit view. The word trauma should not be used, right? Let's even get to that. I feel t in order to really, is it, I, is it the knowledge or is it the having the knowledge or the pedagogy or the relationship to deal with the students to actually see the assets in them? Is it that we don't have that knowledge and how can we as an organization of educators gathered here put together more incidents of success and what causes the success so that we educate our teachers so that we just not inform them but educate them on what are the various ways that you know we can really build that relationship and go the next step forward. I, I'm not sure if that was a question, <laughs> but um, what I would say is, I mean, so there's so many layers of complexity, right? Part of it is who, what teachers are we recruiting? And do we have, what are the possibilities of diversifying our teaching force so that it come already come with slightly different lenses and maybe lenses that allow, that are already inclined them to see the humanity in racially minoritized students in a particular way. How are we beginning to prepare them, right? And do we in this country as a whole pro appropriately scaffold and coach teachers and work with the master teachers who actually do the very good work. I mean, so when Gloria Ladson wrote her book, I mean, the point was she had a range of teachers who came from a range of backgrounds who were doing really powerful things with kids who weren't imagined as being able to do really powerful things. So how, so we know different bodies can do amazing work. Um, with the with these same young people, and so how do we begin to replicate that over time and organize in a profession that allows for it? Right, I mean, right now, we sort of let people loose right after um, um, teacher preparation, and what we know is even those who may enter with better intentions, the very structure of teaching the profession often beats them down. I mean, we think about really even excellent teachers that under the weight of test preparation and drill and skill, they find themselves teaching in ways that they never planned to teach, right? I mean, and, and they'll still do better than others, but they even find themselves drilled down by the organization of the profession. So there are so many pieces that have to be attended. And what concerns me is as the demographic shifts occur, will there be political will? <laughs> to make any movement on that in terms of who's in those schools. Because when you go into private elite schools, you don't see the kind of education we're seeing in public schools serving black and brown people. And the point that you made about, you know, children, all children enter schools eager to learn, well, something is happening to them in school, why that changes, right? Um, and, you know, or what, you know, I think about even like Tyson's work when she looks in the third grade classroom and the kids are so excited and when they're getting negative peer pressure, it's about negative peer pressure because you're not, you're not getting the answer right and you're not engaged and you're not smart, right? What happens later um, for some of these um, young people? So school right now I think is often unfortunately a really toxic environment um, for black and brown kids with, with the exception of when they meet a Miss Hawkins or they meet the teachers in um, documented by Gloria Latz and Billings or they're in classrooms that are in fact culturally responsive. Unfortunately, those are isolated and not currently systematic and pervasive in our school systems. Thank you and good morning. And brilliant talk, uh, Terrell Strayhorn. And uh, just thank you for the talk itself. I mean, I've, I appreciate the complexity of your ideas and the way in which you shared them that compelled me to take notes. And now I'm sitting here with all these questions that are fighting for space in my head. But there's one that I think is really relevant to where we are right now. So um, as, you're, as you were talking about this new um, wide angle and you as an education researcher at the University of Michigan who's who's wrestling with this complex set of ideas and at one point in time you're moving from 
education through uh, education research and history and ethnography and even analogy um, with a set of methods that you and all of us have been trained with, what's your experience bringing this newly exposed, if you use the metaphor of the image, exposed 3D image together on 2D paper in like 30 pages, <laughs> submitting it to a journal where the editor and the reviewers either don't have a clue or don't think the way in which you're thinking about race in the world. Could you share with us your experience and advice? <laughs> It's really the, the, the narrowing of the page limits that are killing me. I'm just, um, and it's funny, because as a qualitative researcher, right, because the power of all scholarship is in the power of interpretation, right? That no matter what the data is or what the quote unquote findings are, if we can't elevate um, the meaning in some substantive way, it's all for naught. And so when you're doing qualitative work and you're trying to add all this context and lay out the three, and then you're trying to build some kind of analytical lens on top of that, and they tell you, you got to get it down to 25 pages, and then they start, they, the new trick of, they actually tell you how many words, because I learned how to push to 25 pages. <laughs> um, it becomes really, really difficult. And I, in fact, wonder if we sometimes have less complex and um, sophisticated arguments often being published because of the restriction in page um, length. And depending on the methodology you use, that constraint could be even more restrictive. Um, but at the same time, the Academy is also ratcheting it up, the publishing opportunity. So we know that that part of that discussion is about creating greater opportunity for more people to get their work. Um, on the stage, but I think we also, but at the same time, I think the biggest struggle is when we, when we talk and write like this, uh, the, the great, greater public has no idea what we're talking about. So there is some purchase in figuring out how not to talk like you're only talking to academics, even if that was not the nature of my talk today, right? Um, and so if we can make our complex ideas available to a general public, we do know that can be said in less than 25 pages. And in the end, that is probably where the greatest power will eventually lie. One more question? Who's? Um, I apologize if this is a naive question, but I, I, <clears throat> the work between macro and micro levels, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I feel as though that I've got a handle on analytically in, in the work, but the way in which those frames are constructed, um, I mean, so you added this other layer, which I don't feel like I'm analytically figuring out how to, how to manage of the way that that those things are, hmm, I'm not sure, I'm not going to be able to ask this very well. The way those things are constructed in the first place, so if it I just, think about some of the macro it. structures that, you know, and then look at how those are playing out in micro interactions or something, okay, that, that I can manage in, you know, in, in the research. But then if those macro structures are being, are artifice in the first place, then, then how do I, how do I analytically bring that to bear in, the analysis that uh, I would be curious to hear how you're managing that. I was having trouble holding on to that. So I think this sort of goes to Kim's point early uh, with regards to, in some ways, it's still a static image, right? Um, in that time is always moving, but the picture you're making is still locked in time. So in some ways, it's an issue of what you're trying to foreground in that particular moment. So if you're trying to more animate the sort of macro historical influence on the micro moment, it may be um, required that you think about what produced that nation state policy in the first place, right? Because these things are always animated by human beings. Anything that, any structure we're talking about, any somebody or some sets of people produced that thing. <laughs> Right? Even though now it has a life onto itself. It was a function of political contestation, um, advocacy, laws on the books, 
um, that happened at a particular historical moment, and we're taking this kind of multi-dimensional space and saying right now we too are bounding it and we're, th and we're deciding what is f to be foregrounded and what is to be backgrounded. And sometimes depending on I would say the nature of um, your analytical considerations, you might have to go back a bit to say why does this larger force, why did it come to be? Because in some ways, it's in what instantiated it might be relevant for what's happening in the ground. But that's where you or us as the scholars have to sort of disentangle uh, the directionality um, and when it is we're trying to show it as a moving, um, a dynamic force. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>